Thank you very much, Lou, for this kind uh, introduction. Yeah, I'm, I'm a kidney guy, a cell biologist interested in chronic kidney disease and who happens to work on the heart. Uh, I've always been, you know, trained and worked in divisions of nephrology, but always walked into cardiac divisions and, you know, ask people how do you culture your myocytes, you know, and what animal models you have from Einstein to Mount Sinai to Miami and now here and a lot of, you know, friendly, you know, cardiac collaborators that I heavily depend on and I really appreciate it. It's a, it's a very strong cardiac field here and that hopefully, you know, will bring my research forward. So you will see with some of the slides, there's definitely some improvement, you know, that we need, but uh, bear in mind, I'm a, I'm a kidney folk. And basically everyone, you know, who studies kidney disease is sort of in the cardiac field. And we don't not only stress that when we submit our grants to American Heart Association, right, and try to get funded for our kidney work, but it goes all the way back, you know, almost 200 years ago when it was really observed that in a patient with kidney disease, there's massive cardiac hypertrophy. One of the key lectures held years later called the renal heart, again, looking at patients that looking at the heart that is dilated, that's hypertrophic. A first clinical trial in 1974, a very small group of patients, but where it was observed that in these dialysis patients followed up for six and a half years, that the mortality is increased and that they have cardiovascular disease, in this case, accelerated atherosclerosis. And that brought the NHLBI really to the point that they you know, brought nephrologists and cardiologists in the room to say, we need to talk about this, we need to define that, describe it in a certain way. And they came up with the phrase cardiorenal syndrome that explains this, you know, describes this risk multiplying, you know, connection between kidney and heart disease, because as you know, someone with kidney disease is more likely to develop heart it, uh, cardiac disease and vice versa. Someone with cardiac disease is more likely to develop kidney disease. And that's a 2008 uh, classification by Claudio Ronco and colleagues published in Czech, um, uh, where the cardiorenal syndrome could be um, put into, you know, five categories, type one to type uh, uh, two, three, four, and five. One describes acute kidney, cardiac injury leading to kidney injury. Type two is chronic cardiac injury and, uh, leading to kidney injury. Type three is acute kidney injury leading to cardiac injury. We have an interest since moving here. Um, it's a major center here at UAB run by Anupam Agarwal for AKI, and, uh, which is associated with cardiac injury. We are interested um, since about 10 years in studying the link between chronic kidney disease and cardiac um, disease, which is labeled cardiac uh, renal syndrome type 4. Type 5 is the syndrome associated with, you know, things like diabetes, where the kidney and heart seem to be hit so much simultaneously. We have also an interest in that. I will not talk about that, but diabetic cardiomyopathy seems to be also um, where our factors that we study be involved. So when you look at chronic kidney disease, the different stages, stage one um, to five, um, uh, in stage five, you have mild to non-symptoms. That's where most of our patients are in. And we have about uh, 26 million patients in that. Stage five is when the kidneys have failed and the patient needs a renal replacement therapy. Dialysis, or best case scenario, a new um, functional organ by transplantation. Um, uh, where we have about 400,000 people in this stage um, that require dialysis at this point. And what you see is this increase in cardiovascular disease. You have here labeled the percentage of cause of death in this population that increases as kidney function um, declines. And um, uh, what you see here in this late group, you know, over 50% of the patients die of cardiovascular disease. That's a very high mortality rate. And when you look at the cardiovascular disease mortality rate and risk, that's 20 times higher than when you look in a patient, you know, with uh, normal kidney function. It's even higher when you, a child develops chronic kidney disease, you look in young adulthood, that's a risk of developing cardiovascular disease, that's so 100 times higher than um, in the regular population, and sudden cardiac death being the number one cause of death in this patient population. A classic scenario, someone not showing up, you know, for dialysis one day and found dead at home, and that brought the American Heart Association to the point about 15 years ago to say that, you know, people with chronic kidney disease should be considered to be in the highest risk group um, uh, for the prevention and the detection and treatment of cardiovascular disease. So you have a wide spectrum of cardiovascular diseases. The major one, the two major ones are vascular calcification. And um, uh, the second one that we are interested in is pathologic cardiac remodeling, cardiac hypertrophy and fibrosis. Um, uh, which increases um, uh, the number of patients, the pre prevalence of LVH um, as kidney function declines. And basically, when you look at end-stage kidney disease, someone in a dialysis unit, you can be sure that this person has LVH. Um, 
The factors for this are, as I said, multifactorial, right? A whole kidney, a whole organ with the kidney is, is failing. Several factors are involved. I think textbook knowledge would be that it's blood pressure and blood volume, because all our patients are hypertensive, obviously, and that hits the heart. But there is more to this, and I'll try to convince you in the next couple of you know, minutes about that. So we are interested in this scenario that's labeled uremic cardiomyopathy, so the pathologic cardiomyopathy modeling that's associated with chronic kidney disease. Again, we have um, hypertrophic growth of myocytes, fibroblasts, activation, in inflammation, uh, infiltration of inflammatory cells, um, uh, um, at cell death. Um, and the question is, what is causing this? And what you find in this patient are these classic traditional risk factors, Framingham risk factors, that are not just risk factors for cardiovascular disease, also for chronic kidney disease. But then you have some risk factors that seem to be specific for um, patients with chronic kidney disease and associated cardiovascular disease. And those include an accumulation of uremic toxins. Your kidney is failing, right? Um, uh, those include um, things like systemic inflammation, which all our patients are, anemia, which uh, all our patients are anemic, which will hit the heart, obviously. And some of the factors that we are interested in and clinical studies have shown that are majorly correlated with cardiovascular disease and CKD are changes in mineral metabolism, which is that these patients have elevated serum phosphate levels. They have elevated FGF23 levels. We talk about that protein in a second. They have reduced levels of active vitamin D, and they have reduced levels of clotho. I cannot talk about clotho, unfortunately, today. That had gained some interest in the kidney field, in the aging field, also in the cardiovascular field. But the scenario here, these four factors and how they are altered, that's what you, a scenario that you find in our CKD patients. And what we postulate is that this can directly hit the heart and contribute to cardiovascular disease. So I don't want to bother you too much with renal physiology and phosphate physiology, but very, very briefly, we have to uptake phosphate, right? We, it's essential for us. We cannot generate it. All our cells need it, right, for all different kinds of mechanisms. Um, uh, we take it up with the food. Um, uh, we want to keep a certain level of it in the blood. Oops, sorry. In the blood. And um, phosphate is stored in the bone and excreted by the kidney. So we, the only way to lower phosphate levels is by renal excretion. Um, uh, we have a crosstalk between the uptake in the gut, the storage in the bone, and the excretion in the kidney. Um, and this is regulated by a um, system of three hormones, which is parathyroid hormone vitamin D and FGF23. And this is very, very important to have a tight regulation of this and to keep the serum phosphate levels very tight because elevations of phosphate can injure cells. And I come back to that later also, what that might mean for the heart. Um, so we work on a protein called FGF23 that's in this context is a major regulator of phosphate metabolism. And FGF23, it's a 30 kilodalton protein that's released and synthesized by bone cells, by osteocytes. Um, it enters the circulation and it's cleaved. At the moment, people believe that the cleavage of these proteins, which can occur in the bone cells as well in the circulation, um, inactivates FGF23. There is really no data out there suggesting that. We are in the process of making fragments, but uh, the field, including us, works with the full length protein, the 30 kilodalton protein. That's the data that you're going to see in a little bit. And then FGF23 signals or target cells by binding to FGF receptors. These are receptor tyrosine kinases. FGF23 is an endocrine FGF. You might have heard of others, like FGF2 or FGF1, which are paragrine. And these paragrine FGFs, they bind heparin as a co-receptor and FGF receptor, and that induces cell signaling. FGF23 is a circulating and endocrine FGF. There exists a total of three in the human or mammalian genome, FGF23 being one of them. They do not bind heparin, that's why they can circulate, why they are endocrine factors, and they require a different factor, which is called clotho as a co-receptor on the cell surface of target cells, which then induces cell signaling, such as resmap kinase activation. So synthesis um, in bone cells and the circulation and then binding to target cells via an FGF receptor and this co-receptor called alpha clotho. Um, so this is how FGF23 works physiologically. So the bone is a storage organ for phosphate. The bone can sense phosphate as phosphate levels are increased due to um, after a meal when we eat. Um, no one knows really what the molecular basis of the phosphor sensor, but the, uh, the bone starts to make FGF23, and FGF23 travels in the circulation and communicates with the kidney. Downregulates um, certain sodium phosphate transporters. Um, so we have reduced uptake of phosphate in the kidney, increased renal ex excretion, which lowers phosphate levels. So FGF23 is made to lower the serum phosphate levels and increase renal excretion 
of phosphate. So what happens in our patients with chronic kidney disease, as the kidney fails, we lose our only organ that can excrete phosphate. So in these patients, phosphate levels go up. Has been reported in many of our patients, the question is obviously what, what might phosphate be doing? Um, what it's doing is it elevates FGF23 levels. That's what I just explained, right? The bone makes FGF23 in response to phosphate. The bone cannot distinguish if the phosphate is increased due to you know, food intake or due to a failing kidney, secondary phosphate increase. And this is when I stumbled over this by really meeting a, a clinical investigator who came at the time to Miami from, from the MGH who reported in the CKD patient these massive elevations of FGF23. When you look at end-stage renal disease patients, elevations from 1,000, 10,000 fold over normal, and you wonder how this bioactive growth factor in the circulation of these patients, what is it doing, right? And these patients are sitting in the dialysis unit and walk, I mean, for weeks, months, years. It's not just, you know, a peak elevation of these factors. And what you see here when the patients receive by transplantation a functional organ, um, you see that FGF23 levels come down again. Um, FGF23 levels have been studied in all kinds of clinical, you know, um, 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 cohorts. Here is CKD stages two to four, blood to mortality, increased levels of FGF23 clearly associated with increased mortality, five-year mortality in these patients. A cohort that we and others use is called CRIC, um, um, which is right here, um, with the goal, NIH-funded cohort, uh, rather large, with the goal to identify novel cardiovascular risk factors. Um, uh, in their cohort is also echo data available when you plot FGF23 levels. Um, uh, um, against LV mass, what you could see is that uh, the higher the FGF23 levels in these patients is, the higher is the mass of the left ventricle. So clear associations between FGF23 levels in the circulation of these patients and increased LV mass, and that's the question we had about 10 years ago when I saw this clinical data was like, can FGF23 hit the heart and contribute to cardiac hypertrophy? And what we did in ours is, you know, the classic usual experiment. We took our neonatal red ventricular myocytes, which are obviously not perfect, perfect but that was a starting point. And we could see when we treated with FGF23 in a concentration-dependent manner that uh, the cells get bigger. Um, that's a study that came a little later from Mike Wacker in Kansas City. He took adult red myocytes treated with FGF23. It was very similar that he saw a dose-dependent increase in the area of these cells. You also detected something um, uh, quite interesting that these cells might um, react to FGF23 acutely by increased contraction, um, increased um, um, uh, calcium levels in the cell after treatment. There are about four studies out now at the moment suggesting that FGF23 might increase contractility in myocytes, which brings up the question, is that something really that's then pathological or beneficial? beneficial? Do you want to block this? Um, uh, a recent study um, by a group in Germany has treated um, neonatal myocytes with FGF23 and reported an increased expression of anti-inflammatory, anti-fibrotic, uh, pro-fibrotic, pro-inflammatory, pro-hypertrophic markers. So it seems that these cells can respond to it, knowing that these systems all have their weaknesses. We have contaminations with fibroblasts coming to the question, is the myocyte, the fibroblast responding to this? People have published data on fibroblasts. We also try to get into this a little bit. It's very tough to have good fibroblast cultures, and we communicate and collaborate with you know, several groups here to improve our cultures. Um, uh, our data is basically not showing what has been shown in these papers, but we have to look a little in more detail. But here, people have done you know, classic experiments to see if fibroblast cultures respond to FGF23, and here it seems to induce you know, activation, collagen synthesis, proliferation, and migration. And we don't see that necessarily also in other fibroblast cultures, um, even if it's an FGF. Um, it's not really um, very um, uh, mitogenic inducing proliferation in different kinds of cell types, including fibroblasts. So uh, that will be very important really to follow up and see if uh, um, uh, um, the meaning of that. Um, what we have spent most of the time with a signal transduction cell biology lab is to figure out what the mechanism is in all kinds of different cell lines. Um, including neonatal red ventricular myocytes. And what we found is that, yeah, these myocytes can respond to FGF23. Um, they don't have clotho. I think that's why, you know, well, other people have not maybe done these experiments because, as I said, you know, clotho seems to be required as a co-receptor. The myocyte, the heart, human, mouse cannot be detected, not just by us, also others in the field. And what we stumbled over is that if there is no clotho in these myocytes, FGF23 can still activate fibroblast growth factors. And the signaling pathway is then just a little different. It's not traditional ResMap kinase signaling, 
but it seems to travel a different path, which is not surprising, right? I mean, signal transduction can branch out, and different cell types respond to the same stimulus by activating different pathways and having different cellular effects. So what we found is that FGF23 can activate a certain FGF receptor isoform for uh, FGF receptor 4, which then uh, induces the binding of PLC, PLC gamma to one phosphorylated tyrosine residue within FGF receptor 4, and that leads to an activation of calcineo and NFET, which is a very um, dominant, uh, potent pro-hypertrophic signaling pathway. One of the key experiments in this context that we did, we treated our neonatal myocytes with FGF23, and one way to look for the activation of an FGF receptor is by looking for the interaction with PLC gamma that only occurs upon activation of the receptor. So it's a readout for FGF receptor activation and PLC gamma activation. We got specific antibodies against FGF receptor 4 from a cancer company. FGF receptor 4 blockade is big in certain types of cancer, breast and liver cancer, with very specific tools. So you could see with FGF23 treatment, this interaction is increased compared to control reactions, and a blocking antibody that's in clinical trials actually for breast cancer at the moment, we could block this interaction. So we were pretty confident to come to the conclusion that FGF23 activates F FGF receptor 4 and PLC gamma in our myocyte cultures. An experiment that we did all so relatively early on was to elevate obviously FGF23 in mice, mice or rats, to see if these mice develop a cardiac phenotype. What we learned pretty early on is but it's very hard to do IP injections and elevate circulating levels. We did this in RAD and Rennie Lysas for it, and we had a tough time. Other groups also faced the same kind of problems. So what we did is we did IV injections, which obviously do not mimic what we have in chronic kidney disease, where you have this slow increase of FGF23 levels over months or years, right, where we rather have, you know, peaks of FGF23 elevations. We did this uh, 10 injections over five days, and what we detected, as you see here, no echo data, only histology and PCR data, it seemed that this induced cardiac hypertrophy in these mice. Over a very, very short um, period of time, there were two groups who have also repeated that protocol and detected the same phenotype, that indeed these short-term injections, IV injections of FGF23 can induce cardiac hypertrophy. Two of these studies have also shown that it can increase blood pressure. We have not looked at blood pressure in our studies. Um, uh, blood pressure by hitting the kidney, interfering with uh, um, sodium absorption, or with ACE2 activity, which is an inhibitor of the rust cascade. So the question is, yeah, it seems hypertrophy, is it by directly hitting the heart or the kidney or another tissue is the big question mark here. A key animal model for us that we work with is uh, for chronic kidney disease is 5,6-nephrectomy in rats. And what we do there is that we take our one kidney and we ligate two to three renal arteries of the other kidney, which causes the death of about two-thirds of the other kidney. So the rat is left with one-sixth of the original kidney mass, and this rat develops beautiful pathologic cardiogram modeling within two weeks. This is actually a study from Markus Brandt in Münster in Germany, and if you focus on the first two bars, I come to the other bars in a second, what you can see is that DCS, yes, I mean, increases, and here's the echo data, increases um, the, the mass of the left ventricle. Injection fraction was preserved. Um, diastolic dysfunction, so potentially a half path model, right, which maybe what you, you would assume when thinking about chronic kidney disease. Pathologic remodeling, when you look at the blood vessels compared to the myocyte numbers, is decreased. The massive fibrosis. Um, uh, so that's the animal model, what we work with. What I want to point out here, Marcus has treated these animals with calcineurin inhibitors, different doses. These are the middle bars. And what he found is actually he, he injected those one hour after surgery, and then he looked two weeks later, so a protection study that reduced the cardiac phenotype, did not lower the blood pressure. He also um, gave a, a vasodilator, hydralosin, um, uh, which lowered blood pressure but did not improve um, the cardiac phenotype. So again, that in this animal model, it seems the pathologic cardiac modeling might be not blood pressure dependent. So what we did, we repeated this study um, by injecting these rats with the FGF receptor for blocking antibody. Again, that blocked the hypertrophic growth, FGF23 induced hypertrophic growth in our cultured cells. An antibody that's well established, went through animal studies, again, and is in patients with breast cancer. Um, uh, repeated the study injection one hour after surgery, and what we could see, here's the echo data, that it reduced cardiac hypertrophy by histology, heart rate, tibia length, it reduced the LV mass, and it improved diastolic dysfunction. 
which was quite interesting. And for us, the key feature was finding here was that it did not improve kidney function, which is, you know, expected because this is not really a model where you improve kidney function, right? We do surgery, the red is left with a little piece of kidney. It did not lower blood pressure. Again, we uncoupled in this model the hypertrophic phenotype from the hypertension. These animals are hypertensive and they have FGF23 levels, I should mention that, of about tenfold over normal. And the FGF23 levels did not come down with this treatment. Obviously, this does not suggest that we block FGF receptor 4 on the heart, um, but systemically, obviously, but it pointed in the right direction. What was also important, what we looked in these hearts is calcium and fat signaling is elevated in, these, in the myocardium of these, of these rats, and um, the application of the FGF receptor 4 inhibitor reduced calcium and fat signaling. Here's an Arcan staining, Tim McKinsey, an antibody that he shares, I guess, with many investigators and some PCR data showing that... Um, uh, that um, calcium and fat signaling is reduced. As a follow-up study, we did a treatment study. Again, 5-6 nephrectomy, we did the echo at the beginning at the day, right before surgery. And then we waited three weeks, did another echo, and then we started the injection after three weeks for, with the antibody and looked three weeks later. And what you could see here, that it's blocked the progression or the further increase um, uh, of the cardiac hypertrophy, the LV mass. Um, uh, this was also seen when you look by histology um, uh, on, uh, on single cells, oops, I apologize. Ba, 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 ba. And um, the fibrosis, there was a trend, but uh, these changes were not significant. So when it comes to the question, you know, if we really plug, um, you know, the progression of the cardiac hypertrophy without affecting fibrosis, would that be good intervention? So we have to look into that, obviously. But the first really implication that you can also treat and prevent the progression of cardiac remodeling in these animals. And we obviously want to go with this in, in bigger animal studies to see. Um, obviously, the company who has developed this blocking antibody is very interested in that um, and uh, to really intensify our animal studies in this. That's an experiment that was done at UT Southwestern by Orson Moe from nephrology with the help of Joe Hill where they injected five, six nephrectomized mice. Again, also, it's harder to do in mice than in rats, but they could induce LVH in these mice. And when you then add, uh, with mini pumps FGF23, you see the cardiac hypertrophy phenotype, how it worsens. This is not published. You presented it in a meeting, and I allowed me to share the data. Um, um, uh, and uh, another point suggesting, or data said suggesting, that FGF23 really might contribute to cardiac hypertrophy in the setting of chronic kidney disease. The last animal experiment, animal experiment that I want to show is um, we elevated FGF23 without inducing kidney injury, and you can do that by putting mice on a high phosphate diet. So your normal chow has between 0.5 and 1.0 phosphate in its diet. Um, what you can do, that's our protocol also developed at UT Southwestern, when you put the mouse on a 2% phosphate diet, um, for three months um, it develops beautiful cardiac hypertrophy and fibrosis. It uh, has elevated phosphate levels, if you fo uh, focus on the first two bars. Elevated FGF23 levels. We do not induce kidney injury in these animals. So that's elevated serum phosphate levels, which elevates FGF23. You have cardiac hypertrophy and fibrosis, as seen by these parameters, um, which is very interesting, I think, as an animal model. And we repeated this experiment in a mouse that lacks FGF receptor 4. Um, at that time, we did not have a tissue-specific R4 knockout mouse available, which we have now, and we will repeat this study. This is a global FGF receptor knockout mouse. But you could see that also in the knockout mouse, you could elevate, we could elevate um, serum phosphate and FGF23 levels, but these mice seem to be protected from cardiac hypertrophy and fibrosis. And that brought us to our model that we believe in chronic kidney disease, FGF23, which is elevated, can hit the heart directly by binding FGF receptor 4 in the absence of clotho which is not expressed, this classic co-receptor right in the heart. Maybe there are other co-receptors involved, other co-factors, we believe. We don't know those. That causes an activation of calcium and fat signaling and then pathologic cardiac remodeling. Um, it's physiologic target like, you know, proximal tubular cells in the kidney. They express clotho and they um, use FGF receptor 1, a different isoform for the signaling that involves kind of signaling and then changes in phosphate metabolism. So there's a chance here if we have isoform-specific drugs FGF receptor 1 versus 4, that we might block the pathologic effect from its physiologic effects. There are many questions out there. I mean, as I mentioned already, what is really the target cell type in the kidney? Is it the fibroblast, the myocyte? Is it circulating cells? 
A question we get a lot is obviously, what about the dose, right? So we don't have this co-receptor. So, you know, do only very high doses really hit the heart and low doses with the clotho co-receptor can hit the kidney? What about the time? Um, experiments that we are doing right now is we are obviously taking this receptor out, specifically in cardiac myocytes and elevate FGF23. The goal is with mini pumps. Again, we have trouble elevating it really with SC or IP injections um, or induce obviously chronic kidney disease in these animals and see how the heart is doing uh, when these mice lack FGF receptor 4 in the heart. So the current state, how people see this link between CKD and, 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 and cardiovascular disease is depicted here. Um, there is a lot of research done of this, you know, high phosphate levels, again, that we see in all of our patients hitting directly the vessels. It's a massive inducer of vascular calcification. When you take a vascular smooth muscle cells, you elevate phosphate levels. The next day, the cell has turned basically into bone. So there is no doubt that the phosphate is an inducer of calcification in general and for sure in our patients. The hypertrophy, we believe, is that it's driven in part, at least, by FGF23. I don't want to stand here and say that blood pressure has no effect. Of course, the hypertension contributes to the um, cardiac phenotype. I didn't have time to talk about clotho, but clotho deficiency that we see in all of our patients seems to contribute to the vascular and the cardiac phenotype. So one of the questions that I always had when I talked to cardiac folks, and it was recently at the American Heart BCBS conference, to you guys, when I you know, first met Martin, obviously learned about this, work on cardiac metabolism is, you know, what's not about phosphate in the heart, right? I'm standing here talking about phosphate, yet the only thing I throw on my myocytes is FGF23. The reason why we are in this FGF23 business is the high phosphate. So um, when I asked this question to nephrologists, they said the cardiologists have figured it all out. When I go to cardiac guys, they said, we have no idea what phosphate can directly do on the heart, right? If it's physiologic or pathological, and there are small studies out there where people elevated phosphate or myocytes and fibroblasts. It might induce fibrosis. It might induce you know, hypertrophic growth, but not well controlled because phosphate binds calcium, right? Is this due to effect that you reduce you know, available calcium? Is phosphate uptake involved? Phosphate transporters are on myocytes and all cardiac cells, right? They need it. But uh, people have not looked at that. So there are a lot of experiments and controls that need to be done. And again, I mean, the reason why we're in this business is when you look at phosphate levels, that if someone on dialysis has high phosphate levels, you know, is more likely to die. And when you look at, you know, I mean, the LB mass and phosphate levels in these patients, it's directly associated. And in dialysis, you can reduce serum phosphate levels by with very aggressive dialysis, actually. And when you do that, the percent of a reduction in phosphate levels is associated with a reduction in LB mass in these patients. So definitely phosphate not just by elevating FGF23, we believe is really a bad guy hitting directly the heart um, in these patients. And in all of our studies, you know, when we look at the question is, you know, what about primary cardiomyopathy? So we are kidney guys, but what is known about FGF23 or FGF receptor 4 mutations in primary cardiomyopathies? We are very interested in that. It's the same with the phosphate, that there are studies out there in patients, you know, where patients had normal or secondary kidney injury and, uh, you know, phosphate levels are associated with increased LB mass, with increased, you know, prevalence of heart failure. And obviously the question is, you know, in cardiovascular disease with aging, you know, or with low income, um, is serum phosphate somehow involved in that? Because the big problem in the population is that we are flooded with phosphate, as you sit here. I mean, compared to the cavemen, to, compared to our grandparents, our body sees way higher phosphate levels, all preservatives that have you know, that you see up here on the food pyramid that's labeled with E in a nice three-digit number. That means it's a certain phos phosphate salt, preservative, gives structure, color, um, taste to the food. Um, uh, if you have one McDonald's food, you have your max for the day um, of phosphate that's required. So we have, we face very, very high phosphate levels. We obviously believe that this can hit our CKD patients and hits them, not just the heart, contributes to inflammation because they have a failing kidney. But maybe it also hits someone with normal kidney function, right? And uh, these long-term feeding studies that we have ongoing in the lab, we are excited about with normal kidney function. I showed you one. And we extend this um, uh, with serial echo analysis to really determine, you know, what phosphate might be doing. Because that's what we believe um, might work in CKD patients or maybe in the general population to reduce phosphate in the diet. Talking to food industry, good luck with that. That will not work, obviously. The food industry is not even required to label phosphate. You have no idea how much you put into your body, which is a problem for CKD patients because they have to watch their phosphate content. Obviously, talking to the patients, you know, to eat healthy and uh, stay away from fast food, also not so easy, right? 
Um, uh, phosphate binders are in clinical in the clinic for um, CKD for dialysis patients, right? To bind the phosphate in the diet so that it's not taken up by the gut. And then when you go down to block FGF23 or FGF23 synthesis, which is, which is tricky, Enchen has made a beautiful blocking antibody for FGF23 that works nicely and it kills the rats, which is not surprising because with that you have high phosphate levels, right? You take away a major regulator for phosphate metabolism, massive calcification in this animal, so FGF23 blocker is not the way to go. Of course, you could say tighter it out. You don't want to completely blocking um, the hormone. There is maybe a, a window for that. We come into trying to identify the FGF23 receptor in the heart and developing novel drugs, you know, to block this. With this, I want to stop and I want to say, you mentioned my cardiac collaborators in Miami, which were very key. Um, Mike Kapilov, who's now at Stanford, um, who helped me a lot, and obviously the cardiac and nephrology family here. My awesome lab um, uh, uh, here at UAB, who is doing the heavy lifting. These are the current members, the previous members of the lab, and of course, our, our funding. Thank you.